Okay, so uh, the outline of the the my side of the the presentation is as follows. So first, I'm just going to say a few things about what an MLN is. So the the theory of metalinguistic negotiation. Uh, I abbreviate metalinguistic negotiation by MLN. Um, then I'll formulate the 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 prevalence claim. So I'll say what what it um, what the idea that uh, MLN is prevalent comes to, and then I'll raise a couple of objections to the prevalence of MLN. Um, one one objection I call the wrong kind of disagreement objection, and another objection I call the the misdescription objection. Um, okay, so first off, the theory of MLN. What what is an MLN? Well, uh, luckily, um, uh, Stefan in in writing the abstract of the of the debate um, already sort of encapsulated the theory of of MLN. And this, I take it, is pretty much as Plunkett and Sandel, for example, described the theory of MLN. The idea is that there's a kind of dispute in which the disputants appear to disagree about a non-linguistic fact, but are instead engaged in an implicit normative disagreement about how to use a key term that frames the dispute. So you can see in this encapsulation, right, there are these two conditions. One condition is that in these cases, cases of MLN, there's no disagreement about a non-linguistic matter of fact. Now, sometimes when Plunkett and Sandel, for example, talk about this condition, they frame it in terms of there being no disagreement over literally expressed semantic contents. And I think, I mean, there's a difference, of course, between there being no dis disagreement about a non-linguistic matter of fact and there being no disagreement over literally expressed semantic contents. But I think in the cases that um, Ark and I will be discussing, it doesn't really matter. That difference doesn't really matter because um, the, the disagreements are otherwise over literally expressed semantic contents. The semantic contents concern non-linguistic matters of fact, right? So, um, all right. So anyway, so there's this this first condition, uh, which I call the non-canonical con condition on um, a dispute being an MLN. And then the second condition, also encapsulated in, in the abstract of the debate, uh, is uh, that um, there is, in cases of MLN, implicit normative disagreement about how to use a key term. And I call this um, condition the implicitly meta condition. Okay. So now I want to just leap right into uh, the presentation of one of the um, alleged paradigmatic examples of an MLN. So in um, Plunkett and Sandel's work, this case appears again and again. The case, the torture case, uh, has a, a real-life analog um, in in the context of the sort of politics in the in the early 2000s in the in the USA. Um, and you can see if you just look at the last element here on the on this slide, um, the the U.S. Department of Justice was engaged in a bit of um, motivated definition making. You might put it that way. <clears throat> anyway, but but anyway, the details of the real life case are not going to matter so much to the things that I want to say uh, about the torture case. Um, so I'm just going to treat it as a hypothetical example. And the hypothetical example is just this: you just imagine, you know, a speaker assertively uttering sentence one, "Waterboarding is torture," but doing so in part because they accept a definition of torture, one given by the UN in 1984, which I've reproduced here on the on the slide. Uh, and then you imagine a respondent uh, replying to the to the first speaker uh, by assertively uttering sentence two, waterboarding is not torture. And they do so, the second speaker does so in part because they um, accept um, a quite different definition of the word uh, torture, one given by the, the DOJ, the US DOJ in, in 2002. Um, now, you know, some some theorists at this stage might say, oh, the torture case is an example of a merely verbal dispute, right? Because what's going on in the case is you've got these disputants and they're expressing um, distinct claims, but those claims don't conflict with one another, right? They're using them to say something. Each of them is using uh, the sentence that they utter to, to say something. And those things that they use the sentences to say, they don't they don't conflict. And so some theorists might say, oh, this is a, a merely verbal dispute. The, the the disputants are speaking past one another. There's no genuine disagreement here. That's not what I think about the torture case and, and why I don't think that about the torture case will come out in the rest of what I'll have to say. Um, but Plunkett and Sandel, for example, don't think that either, right? They don't think that the torture case is a, a merely verbal dispute. They think it's a paradigmatic example of a of an MLM, metalinguistic negotiation. Um, and um, what they mean by that, by describing it as as such, is that, um, and here I'll just sort of skip through some of this stuff. So so what, what they mean by that, so just read the, the jargon-free part of the, 
of the of this slide, right? So what they um, what they what they say about the case is that it's a it's a meta linguistic negotiation because what's going on in the in the torture case is that the disputants are using the word torture to mean different things, and so these sentences that they utter sentences one and two they don't express conflicting conflicting claims, but the disputants do express implicitly disagreement over how the word torture should be used, right? Um, Right, so it's the satisfaction of those two conditions that I mentioned early on that make the torture case right, an MLN. And here, I've just in a more sort of wordy way described these two conditions, the non-canonical condition, as I'm calling it, and the implicitly meta condition. Right, so prevalence. So, so, then, so then the idea that, um, so, so the claim that um, MLN is prevalent then is, is just the claim that there are disputes in philosophy, for example, and elsewhere, um, um, and there's a bunch of them uh, that satisfy both of these conditions, the conditions that are the, the necessary and sufficient conditions on being an MLN. Um, and so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to argue against that claim, the, the prevalence claim, uh, and, I'll, and I'll do that in two ways. Um, so one thing that I'll do is I'll argue that um, to describe these uh, uh, these disputes, um, alleged metalinguistic negotiations, as uh, non-canonical is, is a misdescription. So, so I'll just argue that, um, in fact, um, non-canonical disputes are, are quite rare in philosophy and elsewhere. Um, so that's the kind of straightforward part of the objection that I'll make to the prevalence claim. But then a less straightforward objection is this. I'll object in relation to this other condition, the implicitly meta condition, that um, Plunkett and Sundell, I think they're right that, that, um, that there are disputes that are implicitly meta. And I think um, these disputes are prevalent in philosophy and elsewhere. But uh, many canonical disputes satisfy this condition, that is, many canonical disputes are implicitly meta. And satisfying it is not evidence for implicit disagreements in or about conceptual engineering. And actually, that's something I think I skipped through. So one thing that I wanted to say here, oh yeah, one thing that I wanted to say about the larger context of the debate is that there's these two, two things that are in the background for me. One is the amount of conceptual engineering or conceptual ethics that's implicit in philosophy and other areas of inquiry already as is. And so what I mean by that is in these cases where you have a stretch of philosophy and it doesn't look like there's any, there, there isn't any explicit conceptual ethics going on. Is there any way because um, the, the disputes that are in that stretch of philosophy count as metalinguistic negotiations? And one thing that um, Plunkett and Sandel argue for is that, you know, MLN is a a vehicle for implicit instances of conceptual engineering or conceptual ethics. Um, and so that's in the background of uh, the things that I'm now saying about um, prevalence. Um, and another thing that's in the background is what I think of as the continuing fallout for philosophy of failing to distinguish between semantic meaning and speaker meaning and um, relatedly between meaning and use. Right, so when I say here at the, at the end of this slide that um, uh, implicitly meta disputes are not um, simply by virtue of being implicitly meta, expressive of disagreements in conceptual engineering. What I have in mind there is that there's this separate, dis different, distinct condition, right? That a, a that a that a, a, a dispute might satisfy. One that I'll call implicitly meta star, just to make things more confusing. <laughs> um, so implicitly meta star says, right, that um, uh, a dispute is implicitly meta star when uh, it implicitly expresses normative metalinguistic disagreement over what the linguistic expressions used in the dispute should mean or what concepts they should express in, in the context of, of, of that dispute. Um, and that I take to be a distinct condition, right? So, so implicitly meta is a condition concerning, sorry to keep flipping around, implicitly meta is a, con uh, is a condition uh, concerning um, the, um, the implicit um, uh, normative metalinguistic disagreements about how linguistic expressions are used, right? Whereas an implicitly meta star uh, dispute uh, is uh, implicitly expressive of uh, normative metalinguistic disagreement over uh, what uh, a word should mean, right? Or what concept that word should express. Okay. Um, and if there were a bunch of implicitly meta star disputes in philosophy and elsewhere, right, then there would be a lot of implicit uh, conceptual engineering, conceptual ethics taking place. Um, but so, and now um, on to the objection, now to the prevalence. But um, there, there are indeed uh, 
many implicit normative dis disagreements over the use of linguistic expressions. That's a that's a common feature of many, I think, perhaps all apparently object level, factual, uh, canonical disputes. But these disagreements are not disagreements over or in uh, uh, conceptual engineering. So they're disagreements about word use, not word meaning. So relative to the torture case, for example, right, it's, um, it's one thing to disagree with uh, someone else over how we should use the word torture, right? So should we use the word torture such that it applies to waterboarding? That, that's a very different kind of disagreement than a disagreement with someone else over whether the word torture should have a meaning such that given that meaning, it applies to, to waterboarding. Um, okay, so to sort of flesh this uh, objection out, let me compare uh, the things that I'm now saying um, about implicitly meta and implicitly meta star to something that uh, my colleague Herman Capellan uh, says about the torture case in his um, 2018 uh, book on conceptual engineering. So here he is speaking of the disputants in the torture case. He says, quote, their debate and their disagreement is independent of how particular words are used. It's about torture, not quotes, torture, right? Um, now, if Capellan were right about that, then, right, um, the torture case, for example, wouldn't even be implicitly meta, let alone implicitly meta star, right? It's just not about uh, the word torture at all, right? It's about torture, not quotes, torture. Um, but I don't think uh, Capellan is right about this. Um, and to see why, compare uh, the um, the torture case, for example, to a case of my own design that I call the LeBron James case. Right? So in the LeBron James case, you've got a speaker who assertively utters uh, sentence three, and then another who responds by assertively uttering sentence four. Um, but here, you're not supposed to imagine that there's any, you know, attaching different definitions going on or anything like that. Uh, the speaker of four is just unaware or perhaps disbelieves uh, that um, LeBron James recently overtook Kareem Abdul-Jabbar in all-time leading scoring in the in the NBA. And now about this case, we can ask this question, is the LeBron James case about um, the all-time leading scorer in NBA history, i.e. LeBron James, not about this expression, this definite description in English quotes the all-time leading scorer in NBA history. And in my view, it's about both. And indeed, I think the LeBron James case is implicitly meta, right? Uh, it does concern, um, at least in part, right, a disagreement over um, uh, how we ought to use uh, that definite description. Um, so um, so first, uh, let me try to uh, convince you that the LeBron James case is metalinguistic. Um, well, one thing to note here is that um, the definite description is not itself the semantic referent of any of the expressions used in sentences three and four, the, the sentences that constitute the, 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 the relevant dispute. So semantically, the case is not about that um, linguistic expression or any other. But in uttering these sentences, three and four, the disputants in the case implicitly, that is non-semantically, express beliefs about um, the, the, the definite description in question, right? And here, and here I think this is just a matter of, you know, when, when we um, use words, right, we can't help but um, express uh, beliefs about and convey information about um, those words. <laughs> Uh, so that's part of what's going on, I think, in the LeBron James case. So take the speaker of three, right, who assertively uh, utters uh, sentence three. I think in so doing, that speaker is non-semantically conveying that she thinks that the definite description describes LeBron James, right? Um, and if I'm right about that, notice that that belief is a metalinguistic representation level belief, one that's about a linguistic expression of English. So LeBron James case is metalinguistic. It's at least in part and implicitly about this English uh, definite description. Um, but not only that, the LeBron James case, I think, is also normative and metalinguistic, right? Which are supposed to, that's the characteristic of uh, disputes that are um, implicitly meta without the star, right? So um, why say that? Why say that it's a normative uh, metalinguistic disagreement that's expressed in the in, in even a so clearly canonical dispute as the LeBron James case? Well, the short answer here is that, well, it's reasonable to regard the disputants in the case as acting when they say the things they do as they believe they should, right? So consider the speaker of three again, right? When the speaker of three assertively utters three, right? It's plausible to infer that the speaker thinks is doing what um, she thinks she ought to be doing in so using the the definite description in question, right? So um, 
if she didn't think that, uh, then she wouldn't be doing what she's doing, namely using the description in precisely that way to describe uh, LeBron James, right? And similar things can be said about um, the speaker of, of four and, and, and her and the beliefs that she implicitly conveys. Okay, so then, uh, so then, so, um, so what I think then is that the um, uh, that the 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 LeBron James case is implicitly meta, right? So it's clearly about non-linguistic matters having to do with LeBron James, but it's also, I think, right about this English definite description, um, and at least one disagreement expressed by the case is a clearly normative disagreement about how to use that that very expression. And so when we turn to the torture case and we say, aha, the torture case is implicitly meta, well, that doesn't show anything uh, very interesting, right? Because after all, the LeBron James case is a clearly canonical case. Um, it too is Im implicitly meta, right? And I think, you know, part of what's going on here is that Plunkett and Sandell, for example, they sort of, they, they want it to be that the implicit disagreements expressed in cases of MLN are disagreements in conceptual engineering. So they so they want like the torture case to be expressive of a disagreement of the CE1 or CE2 kind, as I've labeled these uh, these claims on the on the on this slide. Um, but all that we are justified in supposing is that the torture case is expressive of what I'm calling non-CE, right? Expressive of disagreement over whether torture should be used to describe waterboarding, right? But but that's not a disagreement. It's expressed, but it's not. It's not a disagreement about um, an issue in in conceptual engineering or conceptual ethics. Okay. Um, uh, and furthermore, I mean, you know, I think there's just no reason. You know, once we see, oh, this case is implicitly meta. I don't think that's evidence that it's implicitly meta star, right? I mean, a, a case can be implicitly meta without being implicitly meta star. So just you know, evidence that the that the case is implicitly meta is just not going to count as evidence that it's implicitly meta star. Okay, so one one upshot here is that, I mean, I think, you know, so, so take philosophy, for example, it's filled with a bunch of disputes that appear to express object level disagreements over philosophical issues. Um, uh, the fact that when these disputes are conducted in a particular language, such as English, they give rise to implicit disagreements about that very language and how it should be used. It's just not a reason to think that there's a whole bunch of implicit conceptual engineering or conceptual ethics taking place. All right. So that's the the first uh, objection to to prevalence, right? The idea is um, there's um, uh, lots of evidence in the case of an apparently object level dispute for thinking that the dispute is implicitly meta, right? But that's not evidence for thinking that it's implicitly meta star. Um, and so there's no evidence that, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of implicit conceptual engineering going on in, in philosophy. Okay. Um, right. Okay. So the second objection to prevalence, am I, how am I doing I'm on time? Am I, am I running low or how am I doing? I, I don't have my clock in front of me. Um, uh, it seems like it's been 20 minutes, but probably it's minutes, been less. It's been a little less. Okay. So I'm going to wait yeah. through. So sorry, I'm, I feel like I'm really rushing through this and I apologize for that. I apologize to Ark and the rest of you for galloping through this material. But let me now make the second objection to the prevalence claim. So this is the, the objection that I call the misdescription objection. Um, and the objection is just uh, the disputes that, for example, Plunkett and Sindel are inclined to describe as MLNs. They don't satisfy the other uh, core condition on being an MLN the non-canonical condition. And I think this about um, the alleged uh, paradigms of metalinguistic negotiation, like the torture case, for example, right? These disputes, despite being implicitly meta, are also canonical object level disputes. And maybe one thing I should clarify here is that, you know, in my picture, um, a given dispute can express a whole bunch of disagreements, right? And can express some explicitly and some implicitly. Um, and so, you know, it's no, um, it's no evidence that because a dispute is implicitly meta, it's therefore not uh, canonical, not object level. Um, I don't think Plunkett and Sandel argue in that way, but anyway, just wanted to um, say what sort of part of my picture of um, what's going on here with respect to this question of the prevalence of MLN uh, is. Okay, so, right. So I think it just misdescribes uh, cases like the torture case to call them uh, non-canonical. Um, but to to show that to argue for this, let me let me just um, switch cases. So I've mentioned one uh, alleged paradigm of MLN, the torture case. Now I'll switch to 
Another alleged paradigm of, um, of MLN, this is the Secretariat case. It's a dispute uh, concerning this famous racehorse, Secretariat. I'm sure many of you are probably familiar by being familiar with Plunkett and Sintel's work on the topic uh, with the case. So here it is, um, one speaker utters sentence five, Secretariat is an athlete, and another speaker responds with uh, sentence six, Secretariat is not an athlete. And in this case, Plunkett and Sindel, like build in as background that all uh, of the relevant factual information about Secretariat is shared between the disputants, right? So they both know um, all the facts about Secretariat's speed, strength, and so on, and they know that the other knows these facts as well. Um, and furthermore, the disputants are disposed to use the word athlete differently in a range of further cases. So um, the speaker of five, for example, systematically applies the term ath athlete in such a way as to include non-human animals, while the speaker of six systematically applies the term athlete in such a way as to never include non-human animals. So basically, you've got this you know, difference in use dispositions relative to the word athlete uh, in the case. There's not this um, attaching um, different explicit definitions like, like there is in the, in the torture case, but you know, it sort of comes close to that. Right? And then there's also this you know, background shared information about, uh, uh, about, about the, the relevant horse, Secretary. Um, so the question I think it, that we should ask is, but is any of that evidence for the non-canonical character of the dispute, right? I mean, what we get from the background stuff is basically the disputants in the case use the word athlete differently. Um, but I think that gets us at most that they speak or mean uh, different things with their uses of the word athlete. And thus, perhaps don't express disagreement over some of the speaker meant propositions that are expressed by or in the secretary case. Uh, but one of the central lessons of uh, work uh, by Grice and Kripke, for example, is that we shouldn't infer semantic differences from mere differences in speaker meaning. Right? So compare the secretary case to a case um, from Kripke, this is actually slightly modified from Kripke. This is from Kripke's paper on um, speaker's reference and semantic reference. Um, I'll call it the leaf raker case. So imagine that um, there are these two disputants. Um, they see somebody in the distance, the person pictured, right? Um, and, and that person uh, is Smith, not Jones, but they um, mistake, they both, both disputants mistake Smith for Jones, right? And the one utters, uh, uh, sentence seven and the and the second replies with sentence eight, right? Um, uh, um, perhaps right the the speaker of eight thinks that the person over there um, is sweeping, not raking, right? And so utters sentence eight. Um, so I think it's plausible, you know, given the cases I've described it, that there is this disagreement between them at the speaker meaning level, right? They disagree over whether Smith is is raking, right? Um, uh, but that just doesn't entail, it's not evidence for the claim that the case is non-canonical, right? Despite that speaker meaning level disagreement, it's also, right, expressive of a disagreement at the semantic level, right? Um, they disagree, the, the two uh, speakers disagree over whether Jones is raking, right? So they express a disagreement over whether Smith is raking, but they also express a disagreement over whether Jones is raking. And so I think, you know, we should say a similar thing about the secretary case. It's irrelevant to whether the secretary case is canonical, that the disputants in the case speaker mean different things by the word athlete, right? The secretary case is a canonical dispute over whether secretary is an athlete for all that the differing use dispositions imply. Um, right, so so that's the, so just to sum up then the, the, the argument against prevalence is um, there's a whole bunch of uh, disputes in philosophy and elsewhere that are implicitly meta, but that's not evidence that they're implicitly meta star. Um, uh, and, and then the second objection is uh, um, these disputes that uh, fans of metalinguistic negotiation are inclined to describe as non-canonical disputes. They're not non-canonical disputes and the, and the evidence that they cite for their non-canonical nature is not good evidence for them being non-canonical disputes. All right. Thanks very much. Sorry for rushing. <laughs> um, so I'm, of course, arguing for the four case uh, for malleable negotiations. Um, so I guess, like Max, I'll start by uh, just saying a little bit about what a metalinguistic negotiation is. So um, as I understand it, a metalinguistic negotiation, in brief, 
is a dispute where speakers express a norm of disagreement over how words should be used or interpreted through the use of those words, that is by um, using words rather than mentioning them. Um, and Melling, just to kind of bring out what a Melling was negotiation is supposed to be, they're meant to contrast with uh, two kinds of cases. One is just purely factual disputes where speakers are disagreeing about what the world is like. Um, and then uh, canonical disputes uh, that are explicitly about how language should be used. Um, so there are, are lots of examples of what a melanguist negotiation is um, uh, and like or from the literature, uh, Max went over a few. Um, my go-to one is always uh, the Pluto case. Um, I understand that there may be a little bit of danger in giving this example because uh, I'm told that Mac, uh, Michael Brown's going to uh, be giving a talk uh, in this uh, seminar series very soon who will explain why everything I'm about to say is maybe uh, sort of uh, a myth, <laughs> but let me explain what the myth is at least. So uh, the story goes that back in 2006, uh, the International Astronomical Union, um, or the IAU, uh, decided to redefine the term planet. Um, and the reason they wanted to do this purportedly, is that they found many objects in the solar system that had physical properties very much like Pluto's, very similar size, shape, orbit, things like that. Um, uh, and they were sort of, and astronomers were worried that there was going to be a proliferation of the number of planets in the solar system. So they decided to redefine the term planet so that all planets have to clear their orbit, which just means they have to be significantly larger than anything in the vicinity of their orbit. And so since Pluto's orbit crosses was Neptune's, it was reclassified as a dwarf planet, um, much to the chagrin of the public. Uh, so you can find examples of people, uh, you know, uh, organizing protests against the International Astronomical Union, making funny t-shirts and uh, mugs saying things like Pluto's still planet in my heart and things like this. So um, just to consider a kind of a, a not so hypothetical example, um, here is a case of a metalinguist negotiation over uh, the word planet. So there's two speakers, pro and con. Pro says, uh, these astronomers are ridiculous. Pluto is clearly a planet. And con says, no, it's not. It doesn't clear its orbit, so it's not a planet. And pro says, but that requirement is so dumb and arbitrary. To me, Pluto has everything it takes to be a planet. And the con says, but look, just think about it. If Pluto were a planet, there'd be dozens of planets in the solar system. And then con says, so be it. Let them all in, the more the merrier, and so on, so on and so forth. So here it's very clear the speakers are, in some sense, disagreeing over whether Pluto is a planet. But in doing so, they're not disagreeing over any objective feature of Pluto. It's not over Pluto's size or shape or orbit or anything like that. Rather, it seems like what they're disagreeing over is uh, how to classify Pluto, in particular, whether to call Pluto a planet or not. So that's effectively an example of a melody negotiation over the how the term planet should be used. Should we use the word planet to apply to Pluto in this case or not? Um, by contrast, uh, here's an example of a purely like factual dispute over Pluto. So pro and con start the same way. Pro says these astronomers are ridiculous. Pluto is clearly a planet. Con says no, it's not. Does not clear its orbit, so it's not a planet. Um, but then pro says instead that's wrong. Pluto does clear its orbit. So here, it's very clear that the speakers in question are not necessarily disagreeing over the word planet, per se, or how it should be used, but instead they're disagreeing over some physical feature of Pluto, in particular what its orbit is. Um, and so that's an example of a purely factual dispute over Pluto. Um, and then just to kind of bring another example of a sort of contrast case with melody associations, um, of course, there are some disputes where uh, speakers are explicitly talking about how language should be used or interpreted. So for example, um, Pro might say, uh, these astronomers are ridiculous. They adopted a bad definition of the word planet. And then Khan says, no, they didn't. Uh, if they adopted, if they kept the old definition of planet, uh, of the term planet, it would be a mess. Um, and then Pro says, yes, but I think they should have made an exception for Pluto in the definition of the word planet. So here, the point is the speakers are directly mentioning language. They're sort of talking about language explicitly. Whereas in many of negotiations, uh, speakers may not be talking about language explicitly, it may not be uh, talking about language on the surface, so to speak, um, but instead are just using words to convey their normative metalinguistic views. So that's just a simple example to kind of bring out the contrast between metalinguist negotiations and other types of disputes. Um, and I think that when you look at it, often metalinguist negotiations have some key elements to them. 
So uh, one is just that speakers assign different meanings to some word or phrase. And here I'm putting meaning some quotation marks because I don't intend to, to you know, dictate what kind of what notion of meaning we're talking about. We could talk about, you know, Kaplanian content, character, intention, structured propositions, however you want to understand the term meaning. Um, the idea is that speakers in some sense assign different meanings to some word or phrase. And moreover, they disagree over which meaning they should assign to it. So they disagree about, uh, in particular, like for example, what meaning they should assign to the word planet. Uh, and then finally, as the third element, uh, is that speakers express their views by effectively using the word uh, rather than mentioning it. So rather than talking about language explicitly, they just use the word to convey their normative view about how language should be used or interpreted. Um, now, some things that are not required for value negotiations is for speakers to, in some sense, disagree over a word's conventional meaning, or if you like, semantic meaning. Um, so the idea is speakers disagree in speaker meaning, but not semantic meaning. Um, they don't necessarily have to disagree about what a word canonically means or conventionally means. Um, they might know all those facts and still disagree over how the word should be used or interpreted. Um, speakers don't need to disagree over any worldly facts to have a language negotiation. They may agree on all the sort of factual matters, but still disagree over how language should be used or interpreted. Um, and then finally, uh, speakers may uh, not necessarily realize uh, that they're having a language negotiation in the first place. It may just be kind of uh, something that uh, if you try to point out to them, they may not necessarily disagree with that characterization. Um, but in general, we shouldn't expect even re reflective speakers to necessarily realize what they're doing is uh, debating uh, over uh, the meanings of words. Um, so that's just to kind of give some uh, sort of sketch of the kinds of elements you might see in a malignant negotiation. And I think when you start looking uh, at various disputes, both inside philosophy and outside of philosophy, you start to see a lot of these elements uh, in many, many different disputes. So I wanted to kind of give a few examples that uh, may be more or less familiar. Um, so one example uh, are just disputes over uh, genres. Uh, that's a kind of classic example of a malignant negotiation. So you might uh, recall that I think it was 2019 or so, um, there was some controversy over Lil Nas X's uh, Old Town Road, uh, which was trending on the Billboard's uh, hot country songs uh, list uh, until the Billboard quietly tried to take it down. Uh, much, which was seen as very controversial move at the time. It seemed like the uh, Old Town Road had a lot of elements of country music and it was uh, possibly racially uh, mot uh, motivated, uh, this decision. So you can imagine there was, you know, lots of uh, disagreement over whether Old Town Road was a country song. Um, and in those kinds of disputes, what people were debating, it seems, was uh, whether to call Old Town Road country or whether uh, Old Town Road should be classified as country. Another example uh, that is often talked about in the literature is the example of whether burritos are sandwiches. So uh, I guess New York State has a uh, tax uh, or like a sort of sales tax on all sandwiches. Uh, so it's something like 9% uh, sales tax here. And uh, in the, the tax bulletin where they state this law, they explicitly mention burritos as an example of a sandwich. And this has led to many episodes of podcasts and news articles about whether this makes any sense or what led to this bizarre decision. Uh, and so speakers were often uh, found debating whether burritos really are sandwiches uh, or are they something else. So, uh, you know, speakers would say like, oh, burritos aren't sandwiches. Sandwiches need two separate slices of bread. And then someone would say, but what about pita sandwiches? And then someone would say, well, those aren't sandwiches either. Well, what about hot dogs? And, you know, this led to a further uh, debate over uh, whether the term sandwich should be applied to burritos here. Um, and then finally, I just give one more example. Um, a lot of debates over who is canceled uh, end up uh, looking like malignant negotiations over the term cancel. Um, so one thing uh, sometimes critics will point out when someone complains about being the victim of cancel culture is that, well, uh, you know, like just because you were criticized for the controversial things you said doesn't necessarily mean you were canceled. It's not like you lost your job or suffered really uh, severe financial losses or anything like that. Um, but some people, it seems, do think that the word cancellation doesn't necessarily require those things. It just requires a kind of ostracization of, uh, of, a, per of a person for uh, certain controversial things they say. So an example of this might be J.K. Rowling. So uh, speakers... Uh, 
you can find speakers debating, uh, for example, whether J.K. Rowling is canceled. Uh, some will say like, oh, I used to like Harry Potter, but now I guess J.K. Rowling is canceled, so I should boycott the Harry Potter franchise. And then people say, well, no, J.K. Rowling isn't canceled. She's making a fortune off her franchise still. She's not like fired or anything. Um, so in all these cases, it seems like what speakers are doing are disagreeing over uh, what the interpretation of uh, words like country, sandwich, canceled, and so on. Uh, they're screaming over uh, how those words should be used rather than disagreeing over some uh, worldly facts. And moreover, I think it's not just in public discourse that you find examples like this. Um, there are plenty of examples uh, within philosophy uh, that, of disputes that seem to be metalinguistic negotiations. So I think the best case uh, to make here are Socratic questions, questions over the definition of something, or more generally, what is X? So, you know, questions about what is knowledge, justice, freedom, agency, persons, gender, race, content, concept. Like you can go through the whole list of all the sort of big philosophical concepts that uh, uh, philosophers really care about. Uh, there's always a question of what are those things? And in many, time, in many cases, it seems like what speakers are uh, doing in these debates are disagreeing over uh, what we should mean by knowledge, justice, freedom, and so on. So those are classic examples of uh, important examples of melanin negotiations within philosophy. Um, I think many uh, modal questions can also be melanin negotiations. Uh, so, for example, uh, you know, is free will compatible with determinism? That's a classic example that people cite in the literature. Um, some people think it just depends on what you mean by freedom. Uh, so that's another example of a melanin negotiation over what we should mean by free will. Um, a more recent one is about conspiracy theories. So there's some debate about whether conspiracy theories are necessarily irrational or is a conspiracy theory just a theory that involves conspiracy. Um, I feel like those are also meddling negotiations. Uh, and then also debates over moral responsibility, in particular, whether moral responsibility can matter luck uh, are sometimes viewed as meddling negotiations as well. Um, and then finally, I think many um, questions over determination or grounding or explanation very broadly uh, can also be viewed as melanguist negotiations. So is content determined by external factors? Well, it kind of depends on what you mean. Do you mean broad content or narrow content? Um, how do group beliefs and preferences depend on individual ones? Like what aggregation method should we use to aggregate a bunch of individuals' beliefs uh, to form their group beliefs? Um, is one's gender determined by inherent qualities or one's social position? Um, that also might be melanguist negotiation over uh, uh, what to mean by gender terms. Now, um, here I'm giving a bunch of examples of disputes both inside and outside of philosophy that could be seen as meddling negotiations or could be interpreted as meddling negotiations. But of course, the terms of the debate are not whether these disputes could be meddling negotiations. The question is whether uh, they are meddling negotiations, whether meddling negotiations are in fact widespread. So that leads to the question, well, what is the evidence that these kinds of disputes are in fact uh, melanguistic negotiations in the first place? So effectively, uh, the argument I want to put forward uh, today, I just have one basic kind of argument, um, which is broadly a linguistic one, which is that there are certain linguistic signs or markers uh, that you can see pr uh, uh, present in many of these debates that suggest that these disputes might be uh, best interpreted as metalinguist negotiations. Not just that they can be, but that that might be the best interpretation of these disputes. So one kind of linguistic marker of metalinguistic uh, negotiations are subjective attitude verbs. These are verbs like count, consider, or view, um, which convey some kind of attitude on the speaker, but it's not straightforwardly just a belief-like attitude per se. Um, they seem to convey something that something is in some sense a matter of interpretation. So for example, it sounds okay to say, I count Old Town Road as country, um, or I consider burritos to be sandwiches, or I view JK Rowling as canceled. Those all sound like perfectly uh, felicitous moves to make uh, within the context of disputes over whether Old Town Road is country, or burritos are sandwiches, or JK Rowling is canceled. Um, by contrast, it sounds markedly weirder to use subjective attitude verbs for uh, purely factual uh, matters. So for example, it kind of sounds weird to say, well, I count 101 as prime, or I consider today to be Thursday, or I view Earth as round. It sort of seems like the right reaction to these is like, well, it's not really up to you <laughs> whether 101 is prime. 
or whether today is Thursday or whether the earth is round. Like that's just, those are just facts. Like even if they're true, um, it's not really up to you. Um, by contrast, it sounds much better to say, you know, I think 101 is prime or I think today is Thursday or I believe the earth is round. Like even though those are like obvious beliefs to have, it doesn't sound weird to say those things. So the felicity of subjective attitude verbs is one linguistic marker uh, of metalinguistic uh, negotiations or metalinguistic uses of sentences. Another um, uh, marker is mixed quotation. So mixed quotation is a form of quotation that's um, not exactly uh, mentioning a word per se. It's not like this, not the same as mentioning a word in the sentence, but it's somehow conveying something about uh, the word or the interpretation of the word. So uh, very often mixed quotation is used uh, to convey something about a speaker's melinguistic views. So for example, a burrito isn't a sandwich um, or the best country song is Old Town Road or J.K. Rowling is now canceled. Um, those you know, seem to convey something about uh, how the speaker thinks that the word uh, sandwich or country or canceled uh, should be interpreted. Um, exactly what the view is, what view is expressed is a little hard to work out. For example, it seems like when someone says a burrito isn't a sandwich, they're, they are just straightforwardly conveying that they don't think uh, uh, the interpretation of the word sandwich uh, should include burritos. Um, but when someone says, well, I guess J.K. Rowling is now canceled, they might actually be sort of conveying their opposition to a particular interpretation of cancel it. That's being, uh, you know, invoked in the sentence. Um, so mixed quotation seems to be somewhat, there's these, it seems to be used to convey a speaker's melinguistic views uh, very broadly. Um, of course, this is most uh, appropriate for uh, written language, but you can get mixed quotation in spoken language. So either you can do it either by using hand gestures like this, um, or you can potentially use uh, emphasis or focus. Uh, so there's some work by uh, Renee Jorgensen, for example, suggesting uh, that uh, speakers who have you use uh, sentences in a melinguistic way um, often put emphasis on, on the words uh, that are in some sense meant to be quoted. Um, so mixed quotation is used to do a lot of things, not just express the speaker's melinguistic views. So I don't want to suggest that this is like, you know, this is the only way in which mixed quotation is used, or you can't use mixed quotation for uh, purely factual cases. But at least uh, if you just try to straightforwardly apply it to factual cases, it sounds a little bit weirder. So it sounds kind of odd to say 101 is prime. It's like, whoa, like, why are you, why are you, why are you putting quotations around that? It seems kind of weird to put quotations around prime there. Or today is Thursday. You might, you might be worried that like, wait, like, did I miss the time? Do I like, is there, is there something wrong with the calendar? Are we like in a time zone thing where it's like, it's about to turn to Friday? Like what's going on? So, um, if you use mixed quotation there, you seem, to you seem to convey something about these sentences, uh, namely that there's some like disagreement over uh, how a word should be interpreted or used. Um, so it seems like the felicity or the um, uh, permissive, the permission of uh, mixed quotation marks suggests that uh, this dispute in question could be metalinguistic. Um, and then finally, there are certain responses that seem more felicitous uh, in melinguistic cases than uh, in factual cases. So there are certain responses, for example, to melinguistic questions that are um, felicitous, but not felicitous for factual questions uh, and vice versa. So for example, if someone asks, well, with all this public backlash, is JK Rowling canceled? Uh, it's totally fine to say, well, it depends on what you mean. Like in some sense she is, in some sense she isn't. Um, but it sounds a lot weirder to say it was recently discovered that yes, in fact, she was canceled. We all we all knew the stuff about the public backlash and all that, but we you know didn't really know whether she was canceled until recently. We discovered that she was. It's like that's a little bit kind of not the right like way to respond. It seems kind of a strange way to respond. Um, by contrast, with purely factual cases, you kind of get the reverse pattern. So of course, if someone says, "Is Goldblatt's conjecture true?" Um, it sounds weird to say, it depends on what you mean. Like, no, it doesn't. <laughs> like, like Goldblatt's conjecture has a well-defined meaning. It's just, you know, it's just a matter of trying to prove uh, the statement, uh, whether it's true or not. Um, by contrast, of course, it sounds perfectly fine to say, it was recently discovered that yes, Goldblatt's conjecture is true. Um, so in general, that kind of makes sense because it seems like for mental negotiations, the dispute could be resolved by, in some sense, 
you know, deciding what to mean by a particular word, like coming to an agreement about what a particular word should mean is a way to potentially resolve a linguistic dispute. Um, it's not really uh, depending on, it doesn't really depend on factual matters or, uh, or what the world is like. Um, whereas for factual disputes, it's the reverse. It seems like in general, factual disputes depend on what the world is like. So uh, it's like, you know, in purely factual cases, if the meanings are all, all perfectly clear, there should be no disagreement about about like, you know, what those words mean. Um, so it really is just a matter of discovery, not a matter of decision. Um, so those are just a few markers of melinguistic uses of sentences, um, subjective attitude verbs, mixed quotation or focus slash prosody or intonation, um, and the infelicity or felicity of certain responses in the dispute. Now, I don't necessarily wanna say that these markers are definitive of melinguistic negotiation, um, like all linguistic tests, these are very defeasible. Um, in some cases, you'll get melinguistic uses where these might not, these tests might not yield the right results, or vice versa. So I'm not, I don't want to suggest that these markers are, um, you know, completely infallible guides to whether a dispute is melinguistic or not. But they seem to be pretty good feasible evidence in, uh, for one interpretation of a dispute over another. And what we find is that when we uh, try to see how these, uh, whether these markers are present in philosophical debates, it seems like we do find that they're very present in many philosophical debates. So just to take the subjective attitude verb case, uh, for example, it sounds perfectly felicitous to say something like, well, I consider a fetus to be person, or I don't consider a fetus to be person. Um, oh, and by the way, for those of you watching on um, uh, YouTube, uh, I'm just mentioning these sentences. I'm not using these sentences. Uh, so please don't send me lots of hate mail about my views on abortion. I'm not expressing any views about abortion here. I'm just giving examples of sentences. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, you know, it sounds perfectly felicitous to say things like, well, I do or I don't consider a fetus to be a person, or I don't count someone as having free will unless they are the full cause of their own action. Or I view gender to be a, a matter of one's social position. So the felicity of these subjective attitude verbs suggests that maybe these disputes are uh, best interpreted as melinguistic negotiations. Um, mixed quotation is also licensed in many of these disputes. So for example, it sounds perfectly fine to say, well, not all conspiracy theories are irrational or whether one is morally responsible uh, for the consequences of one action may be a matter of luck or concepts are just mental representations. Um, so again, that suggests that these disputes are uh, disputes over uh, how words should be used or interpreted rather than about first order uh, worldly facts. Um, and then uh, finally, um, in these disputes, you see, well, the allowed responses tend to sort of favor the melinguistic interpretation of the disputes. So is content determined entirely by internal factors? Well, it depends on what you mean by content. Do you mean narrow content or broad content? Um, or do iPhones count as extension of one's mind? Scientists have finally discovered that they are. It's like, if you saw a headline like that, you would be immediately skeptical. Like, no, that's not something scientists could have discovered. That's something sort of depends on what you mean by an extension of one's mind. Um, is Duchamp's fountain art? Well, the answer rests on a thorny issue about how to define art. Sounds okay. So the kinds of responses that you see in, um, that are allowed in uh, philosophical disputes, they seem to suggest that many, in many cases, uh, the dispute in question is uh, melinguistic negotiation, or at least a melinguistic dispute of some kind. Now, um, like I said, these are feasible markers. They're not definitive or, you know, knock down infallible uh, uh, guides to whether a dispute is melinguistic or not. Um, whether they are applicable in a certain case is very context sensitive. It very much depends on what the speakers are assuming about uh, sort of the relevant interpretations or, or the admissible interpretations of a word. And there are many cases where the, these sort of tests for melinguist negotiations don't yield very clear answers. So for example, I'm just, I wanna give a few examples of cases where, you know, I personally think these sentences sound fine, um, but uh, many, I think people could reasonably think that these sentences don't sound fine and suggest that these disputes are not melinguist negotiations. So for example, uh, debates over what is real, uh, it seems like, could uh, give, could have these uh, tests apply, but some people think they don't. So like, I think for me, it sounds fine to say, I count virtual objects as real, <laughs> um, but 
some people think that's kind of weird. It's like, well, it doesn't really matter what you think about what's real or not. Like virtual objects, either real or they're not. Or I consider the law of school middle to be valid, or I view ChatGPT as conscious. Uh, again, some people I think find it a bit weird uh, to say these kinds of things, in which case that would suggest that the disputes in question are not mental associations. Um, but for other people, maybe they sound fine, in which case for them, maybe they think it is a matter of interpretation, whether you know the law of school middle is valid or whether ChatGPT is conscious. Or, you know, just to give a few other examples, a Nukem problem, you should take both boxes. Like, that sounds a little weirder to me, but I think it still sounds okay. Um, basically, you know, whether you know, view Nukem problem uh, debates, so like debates over Nukem problem as melanin negotiations over uh, rationality uh, or the term rational or what, you know, you should do. Um, that's again, uh, the test may not yield a clear answer to that question. And then finally, I think uh, certain legal cases are examples where, again, unclear what the tests exactly say. You know, is this law unconstitutional? It depends on how you interpret the constitution. Well, some people think that sounds fine, but some people think, well, no, like, you know, the constitution either does or doesn't allow this particular law. Like, it's not a matter of interpretation what the constitution says. The content of the uh, constitution is perfectly, is like perfectly determinate. Um, so this is all to say that when I'm putting forward these linguistic tests for Mellon's negotiations, you know, they're not going to yield clear answers in every case, but I do think in many uh, philosophical contexts, they do yield a pretty uh, strong evidence in favor of the metalinguistic interpretation. Okay. So just to wrap up, um, my concluding argument is effectively this. Um, there seem to be many metalinguistic, or, or sorry, linguistic markers or signs of metalinguistic assertions, sub subjective attitude verbs, misquotation, and the felicity or infelicity of certain responses. Um, and many disputes, both within philosophy, but also outside of philosophy, seem to exhibit such markers. And so this suggests that melanin negotiations are, in fact, very widespread and both in and outside of philosophy. Okay, that's all I have. Thanks.